Um, so I will just run through, uh, I had a couple of slides in here, but I decided I'd have Jeff just do the introduction real quick. As he said, my, my background was journalism. Um, since I was in eighth grade, there was a show years ago. Uh, remember Mary Tyler Moore's boss, Lou Grant? Yeah. And then they had a show that came out, the Lou Grant show, where he was the editor of the fictional uh, LA Post, I think was the newspaper. And I loved it. I thought that just looked like uh, some kids wanted to be firemen and, and police, and I wanted to be a reporter. <laughs> so I went to journalism school, and uh, as, as Jeff said, I worked for the Associated Press for 16 years. Absolutely loved the career. Um, it really, for me, was storytelling. I got to go out and interview people who had interesting stories to tell, and then kind of translate that and tell it to other people. Some of the stories were tragic. Um, a lot of them were sad. A lot of them were very controversial. But I kind of made it my my job to try to tell an accurate story, get all sides as, as well as you could in a controversy or in a, in a crisis. And, and I took that experience. Um, I kind of looked at the writing on the wall and AP was a great company to work for. But it's one of these companies where if they think you're doing well, somewhere they sort of expect you to move up after a couple of years and I had spent 10 years getting back to my home state of Montana and sort of faced a choice of living in Montana or working for the AP and that was an easier choice for me than I thought it would be and went to work for uh, Gallatin Public Affairs and did that for about six years and then decided a few years ago that it made more sense to kind of do that on my own. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I do a lot of presentations like this with different organizations that are kind of trying to figure out how to be more effective in communicating and building relationships with the media so you can go out and tell a positive story about your business or your nonprofit group or your government agency or an initiative that you're trying to do. Um, and how do you build a relationship with reporters? How do you uh, get develop your messages and kind of strategically figure out how you're going to talk about what you do. So, today's topic, my little press hat here, how do you work with the news media in order to tell your story? Or put another way, how do we get reporters to tell the stories, either through newspaper stories or online or video or radio or whatever it is, how do we convince them to tell the stories that we want to hear, that we think people need to hear about the Montana drug courts. So, four things we're going to cover today. First, why is this important? Why are you doing it? I know when in talking to Jeff that an initiative came out last year basically saying that we need to get more attention, we need to have uh, more press coverage in a positive light on what the drug court and drug court systems do. Part of our strategic plan. Part of the strategic plan, perfect. And that communication side and figuring out how you're going to talk about it, if you incorporate that into your strategic plan, you're, you're already miles ahead. Second thing is, Jeff just mentioned your strategic plan. How do you incorporate strategic communications into that? So that you, everybody kind of has an idea that when we go out and talk, this is what we want to stress. Who are the audiences? What are the messages? Things like that. So that you aren't just out there kind of bouncing off the walls. That you have a strategy for how you communicate. A strategy for how you talk about the drug courts. And I mentioned this. What are your key messages? Has anyone gone through an exercise like that where you basically are kind of developing what? If we go out, sometimes they call it an elevator speech. Where it's like, what are the things that we want when we talk to somebody? We want them to remember. So we'll kind of go over this. What are the kind of the key messages the things that, the takeaways anytime that you talk about the drug court that you want people to remember. And the last thing, and this is, this is the fun part, once you put that strategy together and you know what you want to say, how you're going to do it, where you want to appear, if you want to have video stories, if you want this to be more online, or if you want to kind of go old school and, and have written press, or you want all of it, how do you go out and make that pitch to reporters that they should be interviewing you? Sound good so far? All right. And when I do these presentations, please, if something comes up and you want to talk, it's going to be, it's better for me 
and it'll make it more interesting if at some point you got a question, um, I may call on you just to make sure you're awake as well <laughs> this late in the day. But let's start with this. Why is this important? Why has this become part of the drug court strategic plan? In other words, getting out your message and, and having a, a better communication strategy. Why is that important for the drug court system? More community support. I, oh, I love this. I have three people. What did you say? More community support. More community support. Okay. And behind you? Attempt to combat some of the negativity that maybe comes with, with the courts. Rather than with the courts? Policy. Okay. With the courts and with the people that are involved in your in your programs? Okay. And back here? Um, I want people to know about it so that if they have a family member or even a, a regular MD, um, that they know that the, we have these options. Okay, so just broader kind of public mm -hmm. awareness, but mm -hmm. personal familiarity mm -hmm. with it too. Excellent. Okay. Anything else? Any other reasons? We want voters to support funding. <laughs> yes. Where well, I saw, I heard it. Was it you? Or who said? Oh, way back. Oh. Funding. Voters to support funding. Excellent. So there is a financial component to this as well. Okay. So. I just, I wrote down some and I, I had about, I don't know, 45 days to kind of get a little bit up to speed as much as I could on on the drug court system. And in what you said, you covered a lot of this, that, you know, you part of it is you really want more public awareness of what the drug court system is. It's still relatively new in Montana. Um, it's developing, it's, it's maturing, you're adding programs. Uh, but the general public may not know a lot about it. And there are proven results, even though it's, it's still relatively new. You've got statistics that show that, that this works. It is a, a good alternative to incarceration for a lot of people. Um, it benefits society at, at large doing this. And last, it saves money in the long run. And these are just ones that kind of going through some of the materials that that are out there on the Montana drug court system. These were a couple of them that came to mind about why this is important. So I mentioned I had a little bit of time to, to talk about this and nobody should take this as, as a criticism of any individual program around the state, any of the individual courts or the court system as a whole, but just kind of looking at, at where you're at in terms of communicating and getting out with the media. And the great thing is I found a couple of stories. There was a really good story that was in the Great Falls Tribune maybe about a year ago about an individual, and I think he may have been a veteran. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and how his interaction and his involvement with the drug court had improved his situation. But one thing I found is that there's not a lot of consistency in how the drug courts are interacting with the media. Some are very active. Some are not. I think some are learning. And obviously with everything on your plate, getting media stories very likely isn't going to be a top priority with everything else that you have to do. And judicial canons sort of you know, point us away from that generally. I mean, we're not supposed to be out um, advertising ourselves. I mean, there's an exception for this particular type of program, but I mean, there's a historic um, schooling that's a lot of judges got that you're supposed to keep your head down. I think that's very true. And I, I don't think it's even necessarily just judges. I think it's attorneys. I do a lot of work with attorneys. And there's always that concern. Anything that you say that could jeopardize or appear to be trying to influence, that is, I think, a very well uh, accepted cautionary tale or cautionary note that prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, uh, any of those folks, there is a, you're always a little bit cautious about your interaction with the, with the press. And there's some specific statutes on child welfare cases, which a couple of us have um, family courts where very strong confidentiality language in right. the statutes that you're not supposed to be talking about you know, revealing this confidential information. Right. And and with drug courts, too, if you have, for example, the, the case of the veteran in Great Falls, a great story, 
but um, he had to agree to do that. I mean, you couldn't go out and, and, and just tell if a reporter came up and said, God, I'd love to write a success story and say, oh yeah, Bob Jones, go interview Bob Jones. You can't do that. So you have, you have some privacy issues that obviously you have to deal with. And so part of what we'll talk about is when you, kind of, when you are able to identify a good story, how do you not just persuade the press to write it, but to persuade or convince the person that is a success story that he really ought to get involved, that, that what has happened to him and his involvement in the program can be used to really justify why this is, why it's working. But you're absolutely right. There's there's definitely a uh, that's a concern I think that comes up in in the legal arena with just about everything. Uh, the second thing, there's not, and this kind of is goes along with a lack of consistency in how you're doing it. But there's there's sort of a lack of focus, and it seems to me that the drug court administrators maybe haven't quite figured out what should our focus be? And so when we talked about what are some of the benefits and why is this important, you know, we could probably put a list of, of a dozen things together about why this is an important issue and why we should be trying to get more positive press about the court system. But where we start to do that, what things that we should focus on, do we focus on statistics, do we focus on history, do we try to tell a good story, it doesn't seem at this point yet that there's a lot of consistency in what that focus should be. So hopefully we can kind of work on that a little bit today. Um, and I put this up here as, as evidence, and I'll caution that you can overload people when you give them too many stats in the story. You know, your recidivism rate is 40%, is but it's, it's this rate. But, and because I think the drug court system is still relatively young, Compiling and having that evidence that you can use to include in a story. So when you have a good story to tell about a success, that you can use that story and say, here's the statistics that back it up. And so one of the things, and I know the statistics are out there, I've seen some of them, but when you can kind of put that into a, a format and even just like a one page that you can give to reporters or you can give to lawmakers if you're looking for for support, for funding, anything like that, where you have that data that backs up the information that you provide for. And the last thing is stories, success stories. And this may be, in a lot of ways, this may be the hardest thing to do. And part of it is um, in the administration process, you tend to have to focus on, on other things getting into the detail about a specific participant or um, you know how the program has affected a participant and his family or how it's benefited a community or a sector of society like veterans but telling stories is really where uh, the meat is being able to go to a reporter and say I have I have a great story that you ought that you ought to send a reporter out to talk about, or to go to an editor and say this is something that that is a success within the work that we do, and we can help you we can help you tell it we can we can provide the subjects for the story, we can provide the background, we can provide all the context. Just kind of I'm curious if folks have have tried that and if you've had any success. I'm not sure if the person that is the uh, drug court person from Great Falls in here, by chance, or that was involved in that story. I'm not involved in that story, but um, I'm from Missoula, and in um, I have a co-occurring court and a veterans court, and everyone in the court has a uh, mental illness, and they're very reluctant to have their stories told right. for obvious stigma reasons. Yeah. And we had a young man about four years ago, a veteran, and uh, we, we, you know, we do these little press releases and every once in a while someone responds. And because um, there was some event, I don't remember what it was. And uh, he agreed, he was a participant, and he agreed to have his name put in the Missoulian. Well then, after he completed successfully, he did, he did very well, he went back to college, you know, he's done really well. 
about two years ago, he went back to the Missoulian and he said, I don't want my name in the paper anymore. I don't want people to be able to find it. And really? I was so surprised to their credit, they changed his name. So now if you, wow. go, if you look at this article, he's got a different last name. Um, but it's, I feel, I don't know, I'm just kind of the protective type. Yeah. Um, people, they're taking big risks, and especially with mental health, but also in small communities. So I, I don't know, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Other thoughts on that? Yeah. Go well, we had a mother, I have a dependency uh, family treatment court, and we had a mother uh, successfully reunite with her children, and uh, the TV station wanted to talk to me about family treatment courts generally, and uh, with the agreement of the mother, uh, we allowed her to remain in the room as long as she didn't report what she heard. So to give her a little background on what happened. And uh, later it developed that uh, the mother consented to, you know, an interview, mm -hmm. and where she actually talked about having three kids now. One was born while she were one. She was using meth while pregnant. She got um, having this child um, right. with it, but you know, it was her choice, and she was very proud of her accomplishments and. Uh, you know, allowed that to happen. Now, maybe in a few years she'll want that tape. <laughs> tape I, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. just, it's just complicated. Right. But there it, is, it's, a, there it's, is yeah. a stigma not, to it. Not mm -hmm. a lot of people are in line wanting to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff? I don't know. I've been, I've been doing this a long time. That's the first time I've ever heard of a case where somebody came back and wanted their name changed. Well, he's trying he was, to make his career, and he yeah. doesn't want people to find it. Well, I understand. I understand that. But I'm just saying, that's a, I think that's a very unique situation. I've never heard of that before. In most cases, people are more than willing, you know, when they've done well in, in drug court to, to have a feature story done on them. I mean, that basically most of our stories, and we, we have a fair amount of, of feature stories on individuals that have graduated from across the state, and, and usually they're willing to do it. There are situations where the reporter will say, John C., you know, mm -hmm. and keep the anonymity, mm -hmm. yeah, and still use, you know, and, and still report, right? So, that, you know, that's possible too. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of times when I when I was at the AP, it was sort of we kind of had this rule that you you really couldn't use anonymous sources, but then there were always like a couple of yeah. of caveats to it. Um, I think that that's lessened a little bit more. It seems, particularly if the reason if the reporter can verify that the person is who they say they are. And and the story is really compelling. Then more press outlets will be willing to use their just the first name and the last initial. It does become more difficult though when you're when you're trying to get somebody to go on television mm -hmm. and do it. And then they're because they you know it's a little easier <coughs> in the newspaper to say well we we can kind of we won't use your photo. Or maybe we'll use a side thing so people can't really see who you are. Television reporters are a little bit more reluctant to do that because they really live on that visual and, mm -hmm. and the video itself. So that definitely becomes a little bit more difficult. Do we go to 5.15? Is that what we do? I just be figured I'd better check my schedule. I'll check it. Okay. So all of this is that discussion about how do you, how do, you do this? How do you communicate more strategically? How do you decide before you go and try to make a pitch? What are we going to talk about? How are we going to do it? And who are we trying to reach when we do this? <coughs> so the first part is you have to determine what is your what is your purpose for doing this in the first place. So as a group, do you have an idea of what is why do you want to get out there? And you mentioned a couple of a couple of things, but what is your overall goal in trying to have media outreach and communication outreach as part of your strategic plan? What's the overwhelming purpose for doing that? Education. Education? Good. Other thoughts? Okay, so if we'll go with education, because I think that I think that's a, a good word. I think that sort of encompasses it. You're trying to get people to be more aware and more knowledgeable about what the drug court is and the services there. Is that accurate? 
Okay. So what is your goal? If that's your purpose, what is your what is your goal? If you had to come back and say, all right, we know what our purpose is. We want to increase people's awareness and knowledge of of drug court. The goal, how do you measure that? So if as as a drug court administrator, if you say, all right, we're going to go out and do this. We are going to we're going to educate the public more about this. How do you? What are you going to set as your goal? What? How? What? Um, how do you measure that? The number of people you reach. Number of people you reach. Okay. Maybe the number of uh, if you decide part of this is going to be we're going to let's say uh, we're going to do a presentation once a month for a local civic group. And I have a feeling a lot of you probably do that, where you may go in and meet with a chamber group or, or uh, Toastmasters or whatever it may be. So that's, a, that's one way you can measure it. Uh, maybe you say, all right, before the end of the year, we are going to have one major outlet, media outlet in our community, write a story about us or do a, an online piece about us or a video on the local news about us. So when you're putting that strategy together and you determine this is what your purpose is going to be, you have to be able to quantify it through what is your goal. And part of that is, all right, you can go on and say, and I don't know if you use, and I'm not recommending using social media, but if, just using that as an example because that's what all the kids like to do now, on Facebook, if you were to create a Facebook page, and again, not suggesting you do, but... You know, how many, how many uh, friends or likes are you able to develop? When you start posting material on there, how, are you creating some buzz, in, for lack of better words? So if you have, uh, if you put together a speaking circuit and you say, all right, we're going to get out and this year our court, our court administrator in Gallatin County is going to go out and do four presentations in a year. So every quarter we want this person doing a presentation to someone. And you're going to be able to quantify that. So the goal part of this really is how do you make sure that, that you are uh, able to quantify your purpose? In other words, how do, you, how do you make sure that you can show that we are actually out there increasing education through these ways? Does that make sense? All right, then the next thing is who exactly are you trying to reach? And this may not be one audience, if you think about it, because somebody talked about support for funding. I mean, somebody has to pay for all of this. Um, you may also be wanting to reach the people that actually need your help. The people who, that incarceration is not going to be the best option for them. What about judges? What about social workers? public health. So what are the audiences that the drug court tries to reach out to? Well, there are at least two that I think of. One is the general public. I mean, we, we always want uh, support from the taxpayer because we're using taxpayer money yeah. for uh, this process, this program. And I guess the second, and I don't know if they're the Maybe the first would be legislators who make those decisions about what's cost effective and what isn't. Right. Uh, so we can, you know, keep operating. Okay. I'm just going to have you pass because what we're talking about now, there's a template here that I want to share with you. Pass one around and here do we have I'll sit on the other side. <coughs> so Jeff has mentioned general public one, and what was the other Jeff? The uh, legislators. The legislators. Decision okay. makers. Who else? Anybody else have other ones that that um, you look at, or does that does that wrap it up pretty good? County commissioners. County commissioners. Why county commissioners? Um, recently, we've had our some of our county funding pulled. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. I guess I didn't realize it was funding at the county level for the course, too. Is it pretty substantial, or is it? Depends on the county. Depends on the county? Yeah. But apparently one of them is a little is, less than it used to be. Your county is a good county for support. Okay. All right. So one of the things you want to do, and 
the audience, it's not going to be one audience in most cases. You're going to have different groups that you're going to need to reach out to. And the, the pamphlet that's coming around is uh, a template for helping to kind of create a strategic communication plan. And so it goes over a lot of this, where it's like, all right, what is your, what is your purpose? What are you trying to do? How do you quantify it? What are the audiences that you try to reach? And I make, when I do this with clients, when we go through and create a strategic plan for somebody, I make them go through and list every kind of audience that they could think of. And one of them that everybody always leaves out is your internal audience, the people who work for you, the people within your building. We tend to uh, accidentally leave them out of the process sometimes. And the danger in that is when you're talking about the drug court and uh, somebody, you know, a, a, an associate or an administrative assistant or somebody like that is out talking with folks and they ask where she works and she works at the drug court and you might, she may end up somewhere where somebody's like, oh, I've always been very interested in that, but she has no idea or he has no idea what the messages are, what, you know, if that person's like, oh, I would, I'd love to have more information on that and they're kind of lost as to what they're supposed to say or what their key messages are. So when you do this, and I, and I hope kind of part of this will be that you'll go back and even as a statewide agency or at least individually, you can kind of go back and say, who are the audiences that we want to reach? One of those audiences is, is going to be, and sometimes it's just a conduit, but that's going to be the media. And how, how can we use the media to get to some of those audiences, to get that public message out there? Or to reach legislators. So if you think about it, a good strategic plan, as we said, it's going to identify your purpose, the goals, and the audience. And when you start to get that lined up, basically it's going to help you target how you want to talk and who you want to talk to. And it's really going to make sure that you have a better chance of having positive results and getting the press or getting different audiences more interested in what you have to say. And the third thing is it makes sure that you are consistent so that the drug court in Gallatin County, they may have different examples, the administrator may have a different tone in how he delivers the message, but the drug court administrator in Gallatin County is going to be talking about the same issues as the drug court administrator in Missoula County, so that you are having conflicting messages out there. All right. So key messages, I, I talked about kind of how, how do you go through this and make sure that you are kind of consistently talking about it. The idea behind key messages is what are the two to four, and I really try to force people to limit this part of it because you don't want nine things that you're trying to get people to remember. But if you were going to develop two to four things that you think are what every drug court administrator should be talking about. Just like one or two short sentences at a time. What would you start with? What's like the top level thing that you would that you would want to say about drug courts in Montana? Saves taxpayers money. Saves taxpayers money. Okay? So a financial component to it. Do you want an example? Yes, I would love it. For example, because we just actually wrote this up for our report. Wonderful. I, it's roughly, and correct me if anyone here if I'm wrong, it's uh, fifty-six to fifty-three to fifty-six thousand a year to keep someone incarcerated in prison stay in Montana. For our courts, they can do it, and it costs the taxpayers about three thousand dollars per person. Wonderful. So she skipped ahead to the uh, validation, <laughs> which is great. You got that means you you got a good idea how Next. this works. <laughs> <laughs> You're free to leave, I guess. <laughs> All right, so saves taxpayers money. What's another, what would be another one? We improve our community. Improve our community, okay. How, for example? For example, would you like a drug dealer living down the street from you? Or would you like a contributing community member that can be eventually an outstanding community? Okay, so we have saves taxpayers money, Creates better communities overall. Others? Reduce recidivism. Reduces recidivism. 
which is a, I had to practice that word um, <laughs> driving over here today, literally. It's like, oh, recidivism, recidivism. All right. It's a hard word. What else? Give me, actually, let me go back. Give an example. Do you have some stats or something on that? I should turn it over. Yeah, the over court administrator, you know, just, we just start finalizing. But you've got them locally. Okay. But you've got, you have, we if we, we were do. called we on, you would have we stats do. that you would eventually yeah. be able to immediately go to. Like felony probation reduces it by 25%, whereas treatment courts overall generally reduce it by like 45 more percent. Great. Perfect. So that's three. Anybody got one more or maybe? Helps people recover from drug addiction. Part of the recovery process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. And would you be able to provide like a, a good example? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So I, I just put one up here. Um, and I just was brainstorming at the office. So drug courts and this kind of encompassed a couple of things that, that you said. So this is a little bit more broad. I like the idea of making them as specific as you can. So drug courts are a proven cost-effective way to divert offenders from incarceration. So I've kind of got in there that it, the, the cost angle, it saves money, and it, it gets people away from uh, incarceration you know, versus treatment. So you're going to have fewer people in, in a crowded jail, and for the tough on crime folks, that means you know, more room for the, the really bad people. <laughs> Okay, so I, I put this together as, as sort of a, as an example message. If it, if it sounds good to you, by all means, feel free to use it. And then you have to validate it. And basically a validation point is, is also a proof point or a specific example. And so this is, as, as you started, what was your first name? Kayla. Kayla. So as Kayla volunteered, can I give, do you want an example? It's like, exactly, that's, that's what a validation point is. So when you're talking about this, you can actually, it just comes off your tongue, drug courts are a proven cost-effective way to divert offenders, for example. And then you can provide a very specific, the more specific you can, the better, and the more personal you can, the better. And so the very bottom one I put here is, if you can provide, and you've gotten it cleared, and you have somebody in your court system that says, yes, I would talk to the press, or yes, I will go and do a presentation with you at, at a chamber banquet, the more specific that you can get, the better you are. And you know this, if you ever go to a nonprofit fundraiser where they help kids or uh, families in distress, um, you know, we have in Missoula, or in Helena, you know, we have uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, Florence Crittenden home, and they all do big fundraisers every year, and they always make sure that they get the testimonial. Somebody that will get up and talk about how that program has benefited them. And that is always what pulls at people's heartstrings and gets them in to give money or to donate or to, to volunteer. So the more personal that you can get in your validation point, the more it actually strikes people, it's like, boy, that that works better than the statistics. To see, you know, we need the statistics, but to have that example, that very specific example of someone that benefited from that, that really gets people. So the ones I put up here, you know, it, almost what, what you were saying, that, that the cost difference between somebody going to prison or jail versus being out, uh, under the supervision of the drug court system. There's a huge difference in price. Um, recidivism. The recidivism rate is better through drug court than it is. And I know you're still kind of compiling the statistics on that because the program is still relatively new. But the, the recidivism rate is much better when people go through the drug court system than they do through, through jail or through the prison system. Make sense? Yep. Okay. And here I, I put together another one. Drug courts are playing a growing role <coughs> in treating returning veterans. And I had found in doing the research that, that this is kind of a new area for drug courts. Newer area. 
tell me a little bit more about that and how that came about. What was the, there was obviously a recognition that returning veterans were having alcohol and other drug abuse problems and mental health problems. And so there, uh, there's a judge in Buffalo, New York, who uh, has been a leader in the drug court movement for decades. And he and his uh, drug court coordinator came to the conclusion, based on the number of vets they were getting into their adult drug court, that they would be better off and have a better effect if they would tailor uh, their drug court to the veteran. Okay. And so, uh, and there are ways to tailor your drug court specifically for veterans, and so that's how it got started. And it has uh, rocketed, skyrocketed yeah. the numbers. And even in Montana, it's relatively new here, yeah. the last couple of years or so? Last five um, years. Well, about five? Okay. Yeah, Brenda, you've had one for the longest, haven't you? Yeah, Missouri. five and a half yeah. years. Okay. All right, and so I just I included that as as one just because it was a it was a little bit different, but um, you know there is a lot of focus on those on those issues about uh, problems and concerns that face veterans as they come back, PTSD, um, you know there's traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury. There's a there's a lot of things, and so I I included this one as a potential key message. You know that that this is a growing area that that the courts have recognized and, and mental health experts have recognized that veterans returning from traumatic situations in their service overseas are turning to alcohol and drugs at an alarming rate. And the drug courts have, have um, changed over the years to, to acknowledge that and to develop specific programs to help those folks that are coming back. And then again, that personal example and that story that the Great Falls Tribune did, and I was, I was going to actually include that in the packet and try to do that, and I, I forgot to do it. But there was a really nice story about that guy coming back, and he had suffered a, uh, an injury, I think he had had a brain injury of some kind in, in, uh, in service overseas, and then came back, and on top of having a traumatic injury, he had some PTSD, and, and he had actually, if I remember the story right, he had had a history earlier of uh, before he went into the service of some alcohol issues, got clean in the service, um, and then came back. And after this, after the traumatic injury and the PTSD, that was where he went back to. But he told his story, and he did an incredible job telling it. And it was, I mean, it was one of those very moving, very personal stories. Okay, it is 5:15. Is that right? No, 5:45. Oh, 5:45. Okay, so we'll have a little extra time. So. The next step, and I just, I call this making the pitch, and I don't know if anybody was ever in sales. I've been fortunate most of my life I avoided having to ever do cold calls, but one of the things when, whether you're trying to sell a product or whether you are trying to pitch a story, cold calling is, it's the hardest thing to do. So if you don't have a relationship with a reporter, to just like call a reporter and say, I'm Bob from the drug court, I got a story or I got a press release I want to send you. I can tell you that when you're a reporter on the receiving end of that and somebody that you've never heard of uh, texts you or emails you or faxes you a press release, they don't get a lot of attention right away. Um, and if they are written poorly, and the, we used to call it burying the lead, where if you, you know, the, the story is, is five or six paragraphs into the press release, you're not going to have a lot of luck convincing a reporter to come and spend time talking to you. So I, I kind of call this making the pitch. How do you convince a journalist that they really should write about what you're involved in? Anybody know who this guy is? I'm dating myself a little bit here. I'll give you a hint. This is Deep Throat. Oh, wow. From uh, Mark Felt. Mark, Mark Felt. Yeah. Very good. And he was the associate director of the FBI. And I use this slide whenever I do things about, about how do you, for lack of a better word, it's kind of a, it's sort of an ugly word, but how do you ingratiate yourself to, to reporters? Reporters need sources. And this is always like the best example of, you know, of a source. He was that secret guy. They, they met him in the parking lot. He died a couple years, actually died about five years ago. But before he died, he came out and said, yeah, I'm deep throat. And 
and uh, the reporter said, yeah, all right, well, he's telling everybody, so yeah, Mark Felt was the guy that we got all of our information from. He was the associate director of the FBI, and he was the one that told them, follow the money. So reporters need sources, and they're not always deep throat. A lot of times they're just that guy, and I, one of my favorite stories, when I was working for the AP, I was stationed in North Dakota for a while, and I was told, you're the new ag reporter. You're the new farm reporter. I'm like, I don't. I raised chickens once when I was a kid. That was as close as I ever got. So I went out and talked to the the uh, state agriculture secretary. They had a, an agriculture secretary at the state level in North Dakota. And I said, I I don't know anything, and I need to I need to figure out who I need to talk to. And she introduced me to a guy who was a farmer, third or fourth generation farmer named Rocky. And I can't remember his last name, but she said, go talk to him. He's, he's real nice. He's not political. Even farming is political. And he'll kind of give you the, he'll tell you everything you need to know with the difference between spring wheat and, and durum and, and what vomitoxin is and all these things. So I would call this guy every time I had to write a story and just say, hey, Rocky, can you, can you help me through this stuff? And absolutely. And then it kind of built where he started calling me and saying, did you hear what happened over near Wapita? And they had they had this thing happen with the Farm Service Agency over there. So he became one of my best sources because he kept me from looking stupid, for one, most importantly from my point of view. And he was able to just provide me stories and provide me information. Sometimes I quoted him, a lot of times I didn't. I literally would call him up sometimes and say, all right, um, you know, why, what's the difference between, and this actually happened, I went out to his ranch once, this is embarrassing, and there's corn everywhere. And he's got hundreds of acres of corn. And then I look over, and uh, he's got his garden, and there's, there's more corn, and it's all fenced off. And I said, well, why do you fence off that corn, but not this? And he says, well, that's sweet, that's sweet corn. And I stood there, and I said, well, what, what is that? And he says that's feed, that's field corn, or they called it feed corn. That was, and I was like, I had no idea what the difference was. So he's kind of like, all right, well, we need to we need to chat. He was the one that told me, don't ever ask somebody how many acres they have. That's that's like telling asking somebody how much money you make. So he kept me from making all these mistakes. But reporters absolutely have to have sources, and if you can kind of position yourself as an expert on an issue. And say, you know, when this comes up, or if you're writing stories about incarceration, or you're writing stories about drug problems, or drug addiction, or anything like that, and you need someone to kind of help you round that story out and talk about the interdiction side and, and the options that are available other than incarceration, here's my card. Come talk to me. And I always tell people now, you know, reporters always would call their sources, but sources can call reporters too. And just keep that conversation open. Reporters also need access. Reporters want to feel like they're in the know, that they have some sort of inside knowledge or they're kind of in the loop when things are going on. When I left AP, um, people were asking me, it's like, oh, are you, you going to miss it? And I really didn't think I, I would. And I didn't miss a lot of the work. Um, but what I miss is... I don't know as much as I used to, just in broad terms. I mean, I used to, I would all, I read everything. I would read four or five newspapers a day. I'm lucky if I read a single newspaper a day anymore. Um, I knew all the political people. I, you know, I know who was running for what. I knew all the backstories. I don't know any of that anymore. And so reporters really like to know people who have an important job or who are involved in something that they, they cover. They want that access. And you provide them access as a source. And last, I think this is the last. Yeah, pretty much. It gets back to that. They want stories. Reporters want things that are interesting, that are new, and that have some impact in their community. That's what reporters want to write about. They want the scoop, which basically is if the Billings Gazette had the story yesterday, I'm probably not going to be thrilled about writing it today. 
I want to be the first one to write it. There's a lot of competition in that. And they want to be on the front page or they want to lead the evening news. There's some clout to that. When I was, you know, the AP never actually, the AP doesn't have its own newspaper. It's a news service and they, they distribute their news to all the other newspapers. But it was always bragging rights. It's like, oh, you were above the fold in the, in the uh, Billings Gazette today. And above the fold always meant you were, on the, you were on the front page, the part that laid up that everybody saw when they picked up their newspaper. So what I want to kind of go over here is, is a little bit on how do you, how can you kind of become that person that has a relationship with the press that benefits you, that doesn't create I guess this is important, that doesn't create a whole new line of work for you, that doesn't make your job feel like it's, like you're taking on entirely new tasks too. So I put these tips and tricks together and it basically, it kind of starts with when I talk about how do you, how do you get your foot in the door? How do you make that pitch? Cold calling is, is the toughest way to do it. So, and I still do this with, with clients. If they want to get, if they've got an event or they have a project or they just want to increase the public's knowledge about them, I always say you have to go out and do a little bit of research yourself too. Figure out, um, you know, the, the outlet that you want to reach, whether it's a TV station or a newspaper or a radio station or an online, there's lots of online things now. One of the biggest kind of growing ones in popularity in Billings is Ed Kemick's site, Last Best Place, that's not quite, Last Best News. And Ed was a reporter at the Billings Gazette for years and decided that he wanted to go out on his own. And he does, he does things a little bit differently. Um, he does kind of traditional news, but he also likes to get out and write uh, a lot of human interest stories. And something along on the drug court would be the exact kind of story that I think that he would be interested in. But I tell them, go out, find out what are the priorities for their coverage. A lot of newspapers in Montana, they refer to themselves as the community paper, community journalism, which is a, a way of saying we don't, our front page isn't dedicated to the presidential race. And it's not dedicated to uh, international news. We really kind of concentrate our, our front page and most of our paper on what's going on in our community. And if you have a newspaper that that's more their, their style, you're going to have more luck with them than you are with an outlet that really focuses more on either statewide or even international or, or uh, national news. And then individual reporters. If you know that, that as a drug court administrator, the person who you're probably going to be interacting with is going to be a cops and courts reporter, more than likely. Um, it, do they write about this already? Or is their focus strictly on, I just write crime stories. I write, you know, who, who beat up who at what bar last night? Or do they do more in-depth stories? And that's very easy to do at any newspaper or any TV station. You can go on and they got their list of reporters and who covers what. And you can just Google that person's name and find out kind of where, and you can basically see what their, what their focus is and how they write. Do they like to do more feature stories or investigative pieces that might fit into what you're doing or are they really just covering the spot news that you're not going to get a lot of attention and maybe you're just going to go and find a different reporter at a different media outlet. And then in Montana, this is a huge deal. How long has a reporter been around? We have a substantial turnover rate with reporters in Montana. It's a small market. People start here and, and typically particularly with TV reporters, they, they quit pretty quickly. So if you develop a relationship with a TV reporter, you may be developing a relationship with a new TV reporter six months down the road. And I don't know if you do this, and I saw some of the material that's online, but this might be something to do as, honestly, as a group exercise. And that's really to kind of put together a leave behind or a, a one pager about your drug court. And I would do this kind of at a local level if you can, but provide some, some state stats in there as well. But that's just something that you can give reporters 
if you're just going to go and, and introduce yourself and say, well, here's a little bit of background on, on our drug court and what we do and, you know, um, what kind of issues that we're involved in, who, how, are, how we're structured, who the local administrator is or, or how the whole drug court system in the state, and then really to give the areas of expertise. Telling a reporter, if you're doing a story on these issues, on incarceration or drug use or, um, you know, that there's a, and I know right now the, the big one I've been seeing ads in Montana is uh, young kids using prescription medication. Anything like that where you've got specific areas that as a drug court administrator you can serve as a source, position yourself and, and put that in there that, that these are kind of the areas that I could help you on when you're work, when you're working on a story. And rather than doing a cold call, I do this, and I I still do this with reporters when when I get hired by somebody to to either serve as their temporary spokesman, which frequently happens, where they'll say, "Well, we're we're brand new, and we need some help on this." I say, "Well, let's do this. Let's let's figure out who we want to." talk to. Let's put that one pager together. And let's not go out and try to make a big pitch. Let's not go try to sell them a new refrigerator. Let's just go introduce ourselves, sit down, have coffee, and say, I don't necessarily have anything for you to write about today, but we wanted to come over and introduce ourselves and tell you what we do, provide them that background information, and then just really ask them a lot of questions. What are you looking for? I mean, what is what kind of stories do you want? Is there anything that we do that, that could benefit you and benefit your newspaper and, uh, and, your, and the community at large, too? And really just the idea is to kind of get a sense of what the reporter's needs are. What are they looking for? What interests them? And sometimes you're going to, these aren't going to be successful. This isn't science. Um, you know, every reporter is like every other person. They have their own personality. Um, it took me a long time when, when I left the AP, they brought the guy that kind of replaced me at the AP, um, was just tough to, to go in and even chat with or go have a beer with, personality-wise. It took probably four or five years before we actually sit down and, and, and have a beer and just sort of talk about kind of his coverage and things like that. So you might find reporters that just aren't open to that, and if you find that, you probably have another news outlet in your community that you might have a better better shot at. And then the follow-up. Um, there's a former reporter at, that I used to work with at AP named Ron Fournier, F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R. F -O -U -R -N -I -E -R. And Ron was the uh, White House correspondent for uh, Clinton's two terms and then uh, Bush's two terms, and he left about a year into Obama's first term. And he came in with Clinton because Ron was the State House reporter in Little Rock when Clinton was governor. This is the first Clinton, Bill Clinton. And they, uh, AP promoted him to the White House beat because they're like, nobody knows more about Bill Clinton than Ron Fournier. And Ron did, did this training at AP where, um, he talked about checking the traps, and that was his thing. He's, and he, I remember he, he pulled out a little book, and this was kind of before iPhones. And um, and he said, "I have a I have a little book, and I've got the names of I think he had 15 people, and they were 15 people that on particular days he would call. So every every day there were five people, five different people that he would call." And basically, he said 90% of the time, they had nothing for me. I would call them up and say, anything going on? What's happening? And he says, a lot of it was small talk. You know, did you catch the game? How's the wife and kids? All of this stuff. But he had this constant contact with these 15 people. And Monday, he called these five. Tuesday, he called these five. And he went through. And he said, that's what a good reporter does, is they're always checking their traps. They're always calling people. And I really took that to heart as a reporter. And I always would kind of go through, and I didn't have that many people to call, but every week there were certain people that would get a call from me. Rocky, the farm guy, I would call him at least once a week. The, I covered federal courts, and so the U.S. attorney I would call, and U.S. attorneys, officially, they can't hardly tell you anything. 
Um, but they would always, you know, that office would always like, well, you might, you might check the court records from yesterday. We had a real interesting guy come in. Um, so I would, I, would, I would do that. I would always check the track. And what I encourage people to do is that's a two-way street. That as a, as, a court, as a court administrator, keep in contact with those reporters, too. And it may never amount to anything, but if a reporter does a, you know, does a story that involves somebody with, that had to do with drugs or got convicted of drugs or, you know, was sent to drug court, or even if you see something in someone's story that it's like, you know, that would actually make for an interesting follow-up. Call the reporter or email the reporter and say, you know, I saw your story the other day. Here's an interesting angle that you might want to get in touch or pursue. Anybody do that regularly? Anybody have like good relationships with press right now, or is it pretty, pretty slim? You started. So, so my office is right down from the Justice Court, and the newspaper reporter he, he pokes his head in regularly. Yeah. Is that here and where is that at? Oh, that's up in Haver. In Haver. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's kind of it's kind of fun because he's got first say first. Same first name that I do, so you know we see each other in the home. It's like, hey, Paul, hey, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff, so. How long has he been there? Um, at least a couple of years. Okay. Right. That, that's always that's always good to hear. The yeah. I was gonna say the the U.S. Attorney in Fargo when I was based in Fargo, North Dakota at the time. Um, he. <laughs> I had a great relationship with him. I, I would call him at least two or three times a week. Um, and he never told me anything that he wasn't supposed to tell me, which is always the way I put it. But he always, he was sort of my, my version of, of Deep Throat in the sense that he would always kind of give me a hint about where I might want to be at a particular time of day or something. <laughs> and my favorite example was, uh, I, it was on a Friday night, and I had gone out with some friends, and I got home, and there was a message on my voicemail or answering machine at the time, and and his name was John too, and he said, I, he says, hey, uh, just curious what you're doing tomorrow. So this is on a Friday. He says, just curious what you're doing tomorrow. Here's my home phone. Give me a call. And we did not socialize. We were not um, after work buddies. We didn't socialize, and you know, we didn't go out in social settings or anything like that. And my girlfriend was over the time, and I was like, oh, and I said, and I, I think I had a, a, a bigger sense of myself. He goes, oh, he's going to invite me over for a barbecue at his house. <laughs> and I, was like, I don't want to do that. I said, I can't do that. That's not, that's not appropriate. AP reporters don't go to the prosecutor's house. And I said, well, I'll call him. And so I was like, I had my excuse. I was like, no, I'm, we're going out for dinner tomorrow night, but thanks for the offer. And so I call him, and he answers the phone. And, and he says, uh, what do you got going tomorrow? And I said, well, my girlfriend and I are going to have dinner tomorrow. And he goes, what do you got going at 9 o'clock in the morning? And I wasn't prepared for that. And I, had, I have to prepare if I'm going to lie to somebody. And I, <laughs> and I was like, uh, nothing, why? And he says, you should, you should come by the courthouse, 9 a.m. sharp, I'll let you in. And I said, like, on a Saturday? I said, you know, tomorrow Saturday? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, okay, I mean, is this really that big of a deal? And there's this pause, and he goes, have I ever suggested you show up at a courthouse at 9 a.m. on a Saturday before? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, so I'll be there. Well, it was, I, and I got a nice scoop. There was a guy who had, like three months earlier, been arrested in a, in a big uh, drug case in North Dakota. And he was out on either bond or on his own recognizance, and he was trying to hire a hitman to kill one of the key witnesses against him. And a confidential informant found out about it and said, I can get you in touch with a really good hitman. Well, a really good hitman was a guy named Joe who worked for the ATF. And so they staged this whole murder, and the victim agreed to be part of it and got staged dead in a, in a field. They took a Polaroid, and they meet with the guy, and, and uh, he gives the undercover agent whatever, $10,000, whatever it was, and he wanted proof, and he's like showing the showing him, and he's like, great, he goes, dude, you have to sign this for me. And and actually asked the ATF agent to sign the back of it. And so he signed his fake name, and then he put a number on there. 
And he's like, what's the number? And he says, believe it or not, that's how many people I've killed. That was his badge number <laughs> that he wrote on the back of there. So it was that the relationship, just having built that relationship with him, sort of allowed, uh, there was that sense of trust. And if there was something interesting, he called me before he called other reporters. And so if you can kind of position yourself that you are, you know, you are a source that they can use, you're somebody that, that they can call on. And then on the opposite side of it, as a reporter, I always love the fact that the sources would call me too. All right, I'm just going to kind of run through this. And I've got a couple other handouts here that I'll <coughs> get you up to help out. One of them is I noticed, um, I don't know if you guys ever do <coughs> press releases, um, but this is a, a fake press release that I put together. I actually did it for another, for the nonprofit association. Um, it's a fake group, but it just sort of gives you a sense of, of what you want, in, in one sense, what you want a press release to look like. And really, it's, it's a very simple format. You can find examples of this online anywhere. But, um, you know, putting in there the... Uh, a headline, what you write, what the story is about, and then kind of making sure that you don't bury the lead. Make sure that that you put the, uh, here's and here's one other one. And this is a little, this is just one I, I give to clients when I do the media training. And it's something I developed with another former AP reporter when, when somebody is suspicious or um, worried about reaching out to reporters. And a lot of times people have had a, a bad encounter or a bad interaction with, with a reporter in the past, and so they're very gun-shy about doing it again. And so it's just a little thing that we call uh, the thing about reporters is, and it's just kind of a, you know, what, excuse me, what reporters really want and what their sort of expectations are, and in turn kind of what you can expect from reporters too. You know, I... Uh, I am the public information officer for the Victor Fire Department, a little fire, a little fire district in the middle of the Bitterroot Valley. Yeah. And uh, I think they, they appointed me to that because I'm getting too old to fight fires. But, and so I put together a press release format. Right. And uh, I've probably written 10 articles in the last 12 months and put them on the on the uh, press release format. Yeah. And I, I think what it does is it shows that you're a professional and you know what you're doing, you know, and, you know, your contact information's on there and everything. I, I, every article I've written, they have taken word for word for put in the, in the Revali Republic, which yeah. doesn't mean a whole lot, but, but the more professional I think you can portray you are to them, the yeah. more they appreciate it and, and utilize you. Yeah, that's a, that's absolutely true. And I, when I uh, left journalism, went to the other side, and the first time one of my news releases got used almost verbatim, I said, oh, I still got it. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. I never get a byline, but right. they, always, <laughs> they always use my story word. For yeah. Me. So, and that just kind of gives you an idea of, of just sort of the format of, of what a news release ought to look like, um, you know, and having not just the contact information, but, uh, you know, when it's for release, um, and just sort of that, you know, they always teach in journalism the who, what, when, where, why, you know, so that first paragraph or two, you really want to be concise and say, all right, why, you know, that reporter needs to be captured by that in that first paragraph if they're going to do anything. So getting back, just to kind of wrap up a little bit, be strategic, and my hope would be is that if you, if you have an opportunity to talk with each other at events like this, um, or just through email, and kind of just start developing, how do, we, how do we put together a strategy that really has some consistency across the state, uh, and obviously use the state office to to do that and kind of start putting some stuff together. Position yourself as the expert, kind of what we were just talking about. You, you are experts in this field. <coughs> and reporters are going to be looking for those people to add content to, and context to their stories. And as important as it is to provide facts, 
Um, you know, if, if you can get those details, kind of show the recidivism rate comparisons, how many people have gone through the drug court, how much it's expanded. And when you get into the legislative seasons like this, and part of your effort is really going to be either securing or protecting the funding that you have or securing more funding, being able to justify that and, you know, to show what you've been able to accomplish with the funding that you've had, being able to show if our funding gets cut, this could be the potential. If we had more funding, this could be the positive potential. But find the stories. Nothing sells like a good story. And I know that because of the area that you are involved in, you have to be careful with that. You have all of those privacy concerns. But I really think that if you, know, if you can go out and, and talk to some of the people that you serve and say, you know, I, I know this is going to be tough for you to do, but you have a really good story. You have a very compelling story. And people ought to hear it. And it probably will help in their recovery in a lot of ways, too, having that very positive affirmation out there. That's it. And I finished. Uh, I'm bad at math. Eight minutes early?